For many centuries, the Islamic world was at the forefront of scientific achievement. Yet in modern times, the level of education has declined to such an extent that on the average, Muslim-majority countries have 9 technicians, engineers and scientists per thousand people. For comparison, the global average stands at 41 per thousand people. To understand this phenomenon, we must explore the past. In the previous episodes, we explained how the Inquisition of Ibn Hanbal and the anarchy at Samara ignited the disintegration of the Abbasid Empire. It is during this era that religious and political developments intertwined and set the stage for a new school of theology which would forever change Islamic civilization. My name is Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. If you want to help our channel to produce more original content like this, please consider supporting our funding platform on patreon.com slash Caspian Report. For over a century, the Mutazilite scholars and the Hanbali followers debated the fundamentals of theology and jurisprudence in Islam. The former stressed the importance of innovation, rational thought and free will, while the latter promoted the literal interpretation of the Quran. In the 10th century, a Mutazilite scholar by the name of Al-Ashari had a major disagreement with his teacher. He left the group and capitalized on the popular discontent against the Mutazila, which had been steadily gaining ground since Ibn Hanbal's inquisition. In the following years, Al-Ashari became one of the most distinguished opponents of the Mutazila. He used the philosophical methods he had learned and gathered a following of distinguished former Mutazilites. The group, which became known as the Ashari, combined the jurisprudential arguments of Ibn Hanbal and the theological traits of the Mutazila. As such, the Ashari believed in rationalism and the open interpretation of the Quran. However, the group gave precedence to predestination and argued that reason was subservient to revelation, meaning rational thought and free will could be applied as long as it did not conflict with the sacred texts. This was at odds with the Mutazila who believed in absolute rationalism and free will. Over the course of the 10th century, Mithazilites, Asharites and other theological schools debated and explored the existence of the universe. Hundreds of scientific works were written as there were many lingering questions on how to interpret new ethical inquiries such as the meaning of revelation and humankind's responsibility. As the rival schools of theology debated the sciences, they often found themselves on opposite ends and accused one another as irrational and un-Islamic. The attempt to grapple complex scientific questions is at the heart of the declining attitudes towards science in Muslim societies. One of the most remarkable discoveries of the Mutazila concerned the smallest matter, the atom. In earlier centuries, Greek, Persian and Indian scholars had explored the world of atoms as well. But it was the Mutazilites who had successfully combined all three sources and formulated their findings. Yet, what was one of their greatest achievements would turn out to be their greatest point of division. As theological schools explored the atomic world, it ignited a philosophical firestorm. The Mutazilites argued that atomic substances possessed properties and had the capacity to affect other properties. This reasoning supported the free will doctrine and emphasized that humankind created its own actions independently of God's will. The Asharites, on the other hand, supported the concept of atoms as well, but since they insisted that reason was subservient to revelation, the group took a different view. At the core of the Ashari doctrine was the theory of occasionalism, which denies natural causality. The Ashari stressed that as soon as an atomic accident was created, it immediately ceased to exist. 
there was no continuity between one moment in time and another. For instance, the shattering of a window and the skin color of a person was determined by God's continuous recreation of atoms at each instance in time. The Asherites argued that God determined the outcome of every single atom and that human existence was a series of events each willed by God. Essentially, the group suggested that cause and effect as well as free will were illusions because the existence of humankind was predestined. Such philosophic reasoning may seem strange now, but at the time the Muslim scholars were the first explorers of the atomic world. The concept of occasionalism became the fundamental building block that led the Asherites to deny the comprehensibility of the natural world. It also provided the group with a basis for what was their belief in predestination. It is not difficult to imagine how such a mindset in the span of centuries could influence the attitudes towards science. At the backdrop of the theological debates, the realm of the Abbasids underwent a period of disintegration. Powerful dynasties rose up in arms throughout the empire. Meanwhile, the ruling dynasty turned against itself as the Abbasid relatives openly challenged the seat of power. As rough as this sounds, it was about to get far worse for the Abbasids. In the mid-10th century, Egypt underwent an unusual heat and drought. The crops had failed and famine spread through the cities, which incited riots. An estimated 600,000 people starved to death. In Tunisia, a Shia Muslim dynasty known as the Fatimids took matters into their own hands and invaded Egypt where they proclaimed a new caliphate. As such, in the 10th century the Islamic world was decentralized along feudal lines, which included dozens of separatist regions, autonomous provinces, influential dynasties and powerful Turkish Mamluk mercenaries. However, the rise of the Fatimid Caliphate established a third political stronghold in the Islamic world, the first two being Cordoba and Baghdad. The Fatimid dynasty sought to secure its future and sealed an alliance with Byzantium. To that end, trade between the two flourished. Fustat, Alexandria and Constantinople became economic powerhouses. The tides of fortune were now reversed. As the Abbasid Empire crumbled from within, the Byzantines attacked and gradually recovered their territories. Crete and Cyprus were taken first, followed by the city of Antioch and Edessa. The revival of Constantinople dramatically altered the financial conditions. The wealth, trade and taxes that once flooded the treasury of Baghdad now flew to the Byzantine capital. Along with the revival of Byzantium, Western Europe was recovering from the Dark Ages as well. As wealth and stability slowly returned to the European continent, people had taken a renewed interest in the life of Christ. As such, journeys to Jerusalem were being organized, and within a century, these Christian pilgrimages would lead to the Crusades. All in all, the circumstances were promising for Western Europe, the Byzantines and the Fatimids. For the Abbasids, however, the situation was desperate. The realm of the Caliph had been reduced to the proximity of Baghdad. In fact, in 945, the Abbasids had even lost their capital to the Buyids, which was a Shia Muslim dynasty of Persian origin. Under this state of affairs, at the turn of the 10th and 11th centuries, Al-Ghadir, the 25th Caliph of the Abbasid Empire, condemned critical thought and ordered his subjects to distance themselves from the philosophers and freethinkers of the Mutazila. As such, Al-Ghadir outlawed the Mutazila creed and endorsed the theology of Al-Ashari, as well as the jurisprudence of Ibn Hanbal. It's not certain what prompted al qatir to condemn critical thought since Islamic teaching such as Ijtihad 
actually requires Muslims to self-reflect and raise questions. However, present-day historians argue that it was based on the political situation. The Khalif may have believed that the Ashari predestination would stabilize the realm and make the common folk more content with the injustices, famines and corrupt authorities since these were supposedly part of God's plan, whereas the Mutazila free will incited critical thought which inspired rebellions and political unrest. To enforce his policy, al Ghadir passed a law of apostasy. Prior to this, there were legal institutions that circumvented harsh punishment. As such, the Abbasid Empire had been relatively secular. However, the new decree made it easier to condemn and punish dissidents, skeptics and minorities. On account of the law of apostasy, Muslim rulers persecuted opposition forces by altering the curricula of the state-regulated madrasas. In this context, the Mutazila teachings gradually disappeared from the educational system, while the Ashari sources became the basis of mainstream Sunni Islam. Since the remnant Mutazila scholars could not formally disclose their beliefs, most of them sought refuge in opposition movements such as the Shiites in Persia. There, the theology of the Mutazila would influence the Jafari, which was and still is the jurisprudential school of Shia Islam. In any case, Khalif al Ghadir's reign lasted for 40 years and despite his efforts, the Abbasid realm continued to decline. In the lands of Khorasan, in parts of modern-day Iran, Afghanistan and Pakistan, a new contender was about to advance on the Islamic world. The Seljuk Turks were a highly militarized society and hailed from the rugged lands of Central Asia. Their warriors were accustomed to fight numerically superior opponents and their skills of archery and horsemanship were unmatched. Turkish nations such as the Seljuks and Bulgars were introduced to Islam by Muslim missionaries who had blended pagan rituals with Islamic traditions, which brought a sense of mysticism to Islam. But this also made the mindset of the Seljuk Turks distinctly different from the Persian, Arab and even Turkish Mamluk populations. By the year 1040, the Seljuk ruler Tughril assembled an army, overthrew the old dynasties and conquered the Persian domain. Sensing an opportunity, the Abbasids invited Tughril to recapture Baghdad from the Buyids. As such, a decade later, in 1055, the Seljuks entered Baghdad. Since the Seljuks were new to Islam, their rulers didn't really care about the Ashari and Mutazila debates over theology and jurisprudence. So when Tughril took upon himself the title of Sultan and subjugated the Khalif, he allowed the Abbasids to decide over matters of faith. In addition to this, by conquering Baghdad, the Turks had become the new champions of Islam and so had to answer the call to war, the challenger being the Byzantine Empire. In just a few decades, the conflict between the Seljuk and Byzantine empires would lay the groundwork for the Crusades. And at the backdrop of these events, the scientific community of the Mutazila would be completely wiped out. But this and more we will explain in the final episode of the rise and decline of Islamic attitudes towards science. This was a Caspian Report by me, Shirvan. I want to extend special thanks to our contributors on Patreon, whose support made this report possible. YouTube finds most of our content too sensitive for ad revenues and so has demonetized most of our reports. You can help our channel to remain productive and independent by supporting us on our crowdfunding platform. Check out patreon.com slash Caspian Report for more information. In any case, thank you for watching and Sahol.